on constitutional reform in Hong Kong. So do look out for these. Um, today we have two co-authors of a new book called Cities Without Ground. Um, they are both um, eminent architects and um, they're going to share with us their view on Hong Kong's rather unique sort of urban landscape. Uh, Jonathan Solomon um, on the right here um, is an American architect and associate dean at the School of Architecture at Syracuse University. So Jonathan is going to kick off with um, sort of the formal bit of the presentation and he's also got, as you can see, a few slides of old Hong Kong to show us. And then Adam Frampton, who's a practicing architect and a former associate at OMA, who's about to move to New York to start his own practice, he will join us um, in the Q&A section. So please put your hands together to welcome our two speakers today. Good afternoon. Thank you, Enid. And uh, uh, I want to extend uh, thanks on uh, my and, and my uh, co-authors' behalf to the uh, uh, FCC and also to uh, our publisher, Oro Editions, uh, who are here in the audience for their help in organizing this presentation. Um, it's very uh, it's very exciting to be here in Hong Kong uh, presenting uh, the result of really almost three years of effort of uh, research, uh, writing, drawing, uh, and ultimately publication of this book. Um, the book is called uh, a, a Hong Kong Guidebook, uh, but it is not uh, in a classic sense a guidebook. Uh, that is to say, uh, I would not necessarily recommend it as a wayfinding device, although it could certainly be used as one. Uh, it's really intended more to be an exploration and a kind of explication of the unique uh, uh, urban uh, logic uh, and the kind of uh, unique uh, spatial uh, forms that Hong Kong urbanism produces. I'm going, I have a, um, I have a little bit of laryngitis, you can tell perhaps, so forgive me if I whisper a little bit into the microphone. I have here a, uh, what is usually about a 50 minute uh, presentation that I am extemporaneously reducing down to 20 minutes. So you'll forgive me if I speak a little bit from notes and a little bit not from notes. And Adam has promised to make some noise if I go over 25 minutes, although I don't expect it will be a problem. Um, I'm speaking about Hong Kong to Hong Kongers, of course. So you all uh, know the city's fantastic, uh, uh, remarkable history of growth from the 1960s onward, from scenes such as this, uh, to scenes such as this, where we see the city, uh, a city that never had any excess ground, uh, growing not onto unused uh, grounds, but creating new ground on which to grow steep slopes or land reclaimed from the sea. Uh, your your uh, image of Hong Kong, even if you live here today, is likely something like this. Uh, skyscrapers packed densely together, uh, set between verdant mountains and a very busy harbor. Um, but in fact, uh, uh, we argue in Cities Without Ground that it is not the skyscraper that is Hong Kong's uh, 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 kind of most exceptional uh, urban form, but rather the kind of thick mat of pedestrian circulation uh, that takes place at the base of those skyscrapers, uh, tying them together. Uh, we try to explore these interconnected uh, lobbies, uh, hotel lobbies, corporate lobbies, shopping malls, transit centers, uh, etc., uh, in cities without ground, and in doing so to kind of create a, uh, a theory of Hong Kong's urbanism that can help better situate it. Uh, the, um, the city really is, is uh, unlike uh, any other city, even very dense ones. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, that, that struck me and my co-authors very early on in our time here. Um, but we were, we were particularly uh, uh, frustrated, I would say, at the kind of invisibility of its true order. Um, take very important uh, sites in the city like this, uh, the IFC uh, complex under construction in 1998. Um, you all know, of course, what a, what a, uh, a central urban node the IFC is, with multiple different pathways from many different transportation 
nodes all converging uh, in a, uh, 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 this of course is, uh, forgive me, I have only one pointer. This of course is where the, the IFC tower will go. And that ultimately becomes a kind of four-sided figure, the mall and the, the train station, through which people circulate from ferry piers, uh, bus terminals, train stations, etc., over footbridges to the city beyond. But we don't really have, uh, uh, as I said, we don't have a way of visualizing the way that network connects into other networks in the city. Uh, this is the Hong Kong guidebook, which you can buy at any 7-Eleven or Circle K. Uh, it's based on the famous A to Z uh, map of London, which was famously compiled in the 1930s by an amateur, uh, Phyllis Pearsall, who uh, simply walked through the city of London taking notes and drawing. Um, London and other ground-based cities can be understood uh, in two dimensions by uh, walking around streets, squares, intersections, etc. But Hong Kong, as evidenced, I, I think, clearly in conditions such as this, uh, simply cannot. Its three-dimensionality precludes it. Um, if this woman looks confused, um, it may be because uh, north on this map is pointing down. Um, but it's probably also uh, which doesn't help. It's probably also because she's trying to find her way from the uh, central and mid-levels escalator where she is to the ferry piers here. And while this map, uh, which is put up by the Central and Western District Council, does a fairly good job of illustrating the kind of global connectivity of the, the network of interconnected footbridges that bind the district together, leaves critical parts unmapped, such as the IFC, which appears as a kind of undifferentiated uh, magenta blob at the bottom of the map. In fact, of course, the IFC does have an order, uh, and a very clear one, and one that is mapped um, very precisely, in fact, by the mall itself. So uh, again, you're probably aware that every shopping mall in Hong Kong, more or less, publishes its own little guidebook to itself, uh, some of them quite sophisticated graphically. In the case of the IFC, uh, we have a very nice, uh, highly detailed representation of uh, how a pedestrian might circulate around, what shops that pedestrian might encounter, uh, where there might be footbridges or elevators or escalators. Um, however, uh, this map is limited because it doesn't show any connectivity. It doesn't show, for instance, that there's a, a, a train terminal, Hong Kong Station, uh, below the kind of vertical plane of the drawing. Now, of course, the MTR uh, also publishes maps to itself. Uh, and, and does a fairly better job of explaining three-dimensional connectivity, largely through this technique of kind of stretching the map, the, the three-dimensional drawing a little bit so you can peer inside uh, without breaking apart those escalators uh, so you can still read the continuity. But we don't, again, we don't see that there is an uh, enormous uh, shopping mall and a corporate lobby and an international hotel over here, and we don't see that we can follow this path to Central Station and all of the various uh, exits to the uh, towers and other, and other uh, programs in, in Central. Um, you, again, you are all Hong Kongers, but I'll still illustrate a little bit some of the, um, some of the issue here. So let's say we're arriving at this um, atrocious, uh, uh, outscaled, faux Edwardian uh, uh, mockery of the former uh, uh, Central uh, Star Ferry Piers. Uh, we disembark, and the first thing we do is we cross this long uh, footbridge uh, erected by the highways department to bring us over the, the construction site of uh, the, the new um, central waterfront. We then um, pass uh, kind of briefly through the corner of the general post office and cross a footbridge into the IFC Mall, uh, a kind of sanitized global uh, generic high-end shopping interior complete with uh, perfumed air, highly reflective surfaces, private security guards, etc. Uh, passing out of the IFC Mall, we again enter a kind of network of uh, footbridges uh, uh, operated by the Highways Department, which, of course, if you in, uh, are on on a, on a Sunday, you will find uh, partially occupied by the city's foreign domestic worker population. Uh, we cross again uh, a footbridge um, that is uh, owned uh, by the highways department but maintained by Hong Kong land into uh, a, a semi-open deck in World Wide House that serves as a kind of impromptu uh, food court uh, over another footbridge to a shopping mall branded by, the, uh, by Emporio Armani. 
over another footbridge into the lobby of uh, Alexandra House, uh, corporate tower, over another footbridge into yet another generic global inter uh, uh, high-end shopping environment in uh, Landmark Mall, over another footbridge into the standard chartered bank building, over another footbridge and up uh, uh, what is essentially the, the ridge of a uh, colonial era retaining wall, battery path, uh, leading behind St. John's Cathedral to a Chung Kong Garden, which despite its uh, kind of overall pleasantness and, and verdure is a complete fabrication. Uh, those rocky outcroppings are uh, concrete shaped to look like rock. Uh, it has artificial water courses, etc., cetera, um, and is built over a parking garage. Our innovation in Cities Without Ground was simply to represent all of these spaces in the continuity in which they are actually, actually experienced, uh, undifferentiated by lines of ownership, uh, uh, differentiations between interior and exterior, uh, differentiations between public and private, etc. We adopted the simple format of the stretched uh, axonometric um, drawing, uh, which um, uh, we borrowed from the MTR. And then we set off uh, for some fairly rigorous uh, footwork uh, by limiting ourselves to drawing only those spaces that are accessible to pedestrians. We were able to conduct all of our research uh, firsthand or by examining publicly available documentation such as the shopping mall guides or um, exit path diagrams near elevator cores, etc. Um, <clears throat> in the case of the IFC and of course Exchange Square, we, uh, we see the mall now as, um, I'll try to do this without hitting Adam in the side of the face with my laser pointer, uh, we see the mall as a kind of four-sided, again, a four-sided figure here at the, at the heart of a nexus of uh, pathways that connect transit spaces and other programs together. We also are able to observe a, a kind of fascinating and unique culture developing, which we try to illustrate by uh, labeling the activities that we encountered over many years of passing through these spaces uh, within or around them. So um, amateur musicians perform on the exterior footbridges while professional pianists are playing in the IFC mall. Uh, Knockoff goods are being sold mere meters from boutiques that are carrying the real thing. Uh, professionals, uh, tourists, expat bankers, foreign domestic workers, local commuters, etc all converge. Um, in Cities Without Ground, we map uh, 35 uh, such sites throughout the city. Uh, in Mongkok East, for example, a footbridge uh, from Mongkok Station leads uh, 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 here uh, through Mongkok East, the commuter rail station, uh, to the, uh, 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 I think it's the Grand Century Plaza shopping mall the Royal Plaza Hotel, down two levels of escalators, over an elevated footbridge over Prince Edwards Road West, uh, past a flower market, up onto an elevated park that serves as an impromptu bird market, before crossing yet another footbridge over Boundary Street, which of course is the historic border between Hong Kong and uh, the territory of Hong Kong and the Qing Dynasty China before the acquisition of the new territories. In um, Lam Tin, uh, suburban, uh, 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 kind of suburban transit hub built over the expressway, <clears throat> excuse me, below um, Sinway Gardens uh, here, uh, is connected to older housing estates on the hill through um, eight stories of escalators and two uh, private shopping malls, Sinway Plaza and the Kai Tin Shopping Center. You can also, of course, make the journey on 122 steps uh, outdoors, and when we visited, there was one lone granny uh, slowly walking up those steps. Um, <clears throat> Hong Kong is um, neither the result of uh, uh, comprehensive top down planning, nor is it the result of purely bottom up informal solution finding. This image. Uh, we think uh, this is of the old, uh, excuse me, this is the old um, uh, post office on uh, uh, Connaught Road and, uh, uh, forgive me, uh, Petter Street, um, torn down in uh, the 1970s, um, shown just as the sort of surrounding footbridges are starting to penetrate it. And we think this image illustrates very nicely uh, the um, 
the, some of the ways in which those two forces, uh, the, the top-down planning and the kind of bottom-up solution finding in the city, collaborate uh, to produce a very unique uh, urban form. Um, let me give this bridge as an example. Uh, this is Chatter Road in uh, 1965. The bridge is joining Prince's Building with the uh, Mandarin Hotel. And uh, two properties both owned by Hong Kong land. It's hard to, and of course in the distance there, sorry, you can see um, uh, the old uh, Hong Kong club uh, through here, which was torn down uh, and replaced by a lovely uh, Harry Seidler skyscraper. Um, it's hard to see this bridge as anything other than uh, uh, a kind of opportunistic uh, uh, attempt to maximize uh, profits for the developer, right? It's a kind of a one-off. Even though, of course, the elevated deck, uh, if there are any architects or planners in the room, elevated decks have a kind of modernist pedigree. Um, and uh, figures like, um, like uh, Colin Buchanan uh, and his, uh, his book Traffic in Towns had, had significant influence on Hong Kong planners at the time. Um, this bridge, it, it's hard to see this bridge as part of any larger plan. It's simply an attempt by the developer to bring the wealthy tourists directly into the elevated shopping deck and maximize uh, profits. However, the, 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 the technique, the, the network proves uh, uh, valuable, it proves to work. In other words, uh, the, the uh, developer can lease that elevated space at uh, rents that are as high as, uh, if not higher, than their ground floor spaces. And, and people start to realize they can commute more easily. They don't have to wait for traffic lights. They can kind of move through buildings as more and more are connected on a, on a kind of bit-by-bit -bit basis. And by the early 1980s, uh, the Hong Kong government says, well, hey, this is a great idea. We should get involved as well. And it's hard to see this network of footbridges, which is erected by the highways department. Uh, this is Connaught Road in 1982. Uh, as anything other than a top-down attempt by the Hong Kong government to uh, ease the movement of commuters from ferry piers on one side of the newly expanded roadway uh, to the city on the other. But the resulting complex, uh, as I suggested earlier, uh, falls into neither of these top-down or bottom-up categories. Highways Department owns bridges, private developers maintain many of them, and of course own the lobbies and shopping malls that they intersect. If either party shuts their portions down, the system ceases to function. Uh, the network is neither the product of abstract ideas nor the result of top-down planning or of kind of purely self-organizing systems. It's some new and combined thing. Um, how, much, how much more time do I have? How am I doing? I've lost count. All right. Let me, let me go on to, to talk about two other examples of this phenomena. Uh, and then uh, maybe we can take some questions and have some discussion. Uh, and I'll direct you, of course, to the book, which I believe there are some copies of here, for some more detail on some more buildings that we found uh, exemplary of some of these conditions in the city. Um, let me suggest uh, uh, quickly two more examples of the kind of unique urbanism of uh, Hong Kong. One, of course, is the central and um, mid-levels escalator envisaged by the highways department as a kind of traffic reliever, uh, as a way of reducing the, the, the traffic on roads, uh, it of course had unexpected effects uh, after its construction. It's shown here uh, shortly after it opened in 1994. Um, the escalator, of course, by making the hillside of what had been a kind of sleepy neighborhood behind Central more accessible, uh, transformed it into a premier entertainment district and brought new congestion, uh, actually increasing pedestrian traffic, and of course, raising land values. Uh, there are now a series of escalators being considered in the territory, many of them on the west side of Hong Kong Island, two, several of them already constructed. It was just on Center Streets the other day. Um, the conversation now around these escalators is not a top-down conversation of the government seeking to mitigate uh, traffic, but a bottom-up conversation of local districts who either, either landowners generally, developers who want to see the gentrifying effects of the central and mid-levels escalator, and again generally local residents uh, who feel that they're threatened by those same effects and who don't want to see that kind of uh, gentrification. Um, 
Okay, secondly, and perhaps a less well-known example, a favorite of mine, are the uh, express collators in Times Square over in Causeway Bay. Many of you remember, perhaps, that Times Square used to be an atrium mall built on the uh, North American uh, model, a uh, nine-story high atrium uh, with a kind of switchback escalator system that circulated you past as many shops as possible. This in Hong Kong's kind of hyper um, uh, shopping environment proved uh, ineffective, insufficient to move people up to the higher levels in the food courts, etc. So that void, that kind of emptiness got filled by these uh, sort of skip stop uh, express escalators which spiral up from the ground floor and allow you to kind of hop from one to the other shaving, oh, I don't know, nearly 120 seconds off of that journey, uh, but apparently uh, worth the tremendous expense of bringing them in. Uh, the, ex the, the express escalators, I, I liken them to, um, uh, to kind of paths that get tread on a campus quad uh, in the grass when students cut the kind of shortcut from one door to another, uh, which uh, generally okay, we wear down the lawn and then the the college will come in and see this and they'll pave them over and create a path. Similarly, there was clearly a line of desire. Hong, Kong, Hong Kongers desired to move faster uh, informally up to the top of the shopping mall and that line got formalized by this, uh, uh, by the imposition of the express escalators. This is a kind of a, a, an example in microcosm of what occurs uh, at a larger scale in the city. Um, we have a little more material uh, in the book, and we look specifically at some Hong Kong buildings. I think I'll just mention them by name here and then wrap up. Uh, uh, one of them is uh, Shuntak Center, all buildings from the early 1980s, more or less, that fall out of the city's mainstream architectural narrative, but are nonetheless exceptional. One is, is uh, Shuntak Center in, in uh, Shangwan, uh, on the site of the Macau Ferry, a building which wonderfully illustrates the lack of a kind of stable ground in the city, but the kind of hyper-connectivity between transit modes that the city uh, espouses. Uh, the other is Queensway Plaza, a recently renovated shopping mall built over the Admiralty uh, uh, train station. Um, a, a peculiar building form, a kind of windowless, uh, solid, one-story podium without a tower, uh, dropped in the middle of what should be a void between six buildings uh, built on top of the MTR station. Um, and then finally, the Lockhart Road Municipal Services Building, an uh, 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 early example of the kind of uh, combined uh, wet market and community center in Hong Kong neighborhoods. Uh, uh, we, we, try to, uh, we try to conclude uh, the book with a statement about uh, space and politics in the city. And I, I wanted to show this image before, uh, before wrapping up. This, of course, is Occupy Hong Kong, uh, which uh, until September of last year, uh, uh, for nearly a year uh, was uh, encamped in the uh, space under uh, the HSBC main building. Uh, of course, in New York, in Zuccotti Park, the Occupy Wall Street movement uh, was in the space adjacent to global capital. In Hong Kong, uh, the Occupy movement was literally under uh, the space of global capital or within the space of global capital. Uh, the very week that uh, this encampment was cleared. Uh, protests against the uh, imposition of national education in secondary school curricula occupied the footbridges uh, surrounding the new government headquarters at Tamar. Uh, this and other moments uh, uh, in the city in which the kind of residual spaces, the shopping malls, the, the um, uh, atria, the the footbridges of the city get occupied not just for mundane activities, uh, uh, kind of quotidian activities, but for political activities, demonstrates uh, the viability in Hong Kong of this network as a, uh, a public space or a space of public occupation. So with that, I'll, I'll wrap up and we'll have some time for conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. You're welcome. You know what, I'm actually going to go back to that view rather than reveal my, um, <laughs> my notes. All right. right. If you want to, yeah, join us here. Turn your mics on. Um, so, um, let's start a QA. and um, I can see a hand there, Edith. Um, can she have the mic, please? This is more of a suggestion sure. than a question. Um, when I first arrived in Hong Kong, 
uh, one of my colleagues showed me uh, how to navigate the walkways and reduce a trip of about, I don't know, probably hours <laughs> getting across uh, from Central to Admiralty to a few minutes. Now, the suggestion is that you quickly pad an app on this uh, with GPS uh, navigation tools to, for people to get around the city and not just the central part, but uh, these outline, the, you know, the, the new towns and other areas that you've also so kindly mapped for us. Is that doable, gentlemen? I'll bring that up with my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question. Um, okay, I saw that hand first. Gentleman at the back, please. Uh, John Home 5216. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that. Uh, I was in the company that operated Times Square, mm. and one of the reasons why those travel agents are uh, bypassing floors is, on my own admission, a short provision of lifts originally. So really you couldn't get people up and down in time, and you couldn't add more lifts at that time. But in fact, if you look at Times Square today, there are more, more lifts. Some cargo lifts have been turned into big, big lifts. And these things were, it rose out of absolute necessity, really. That's a clarification for you. The other thing which I really wanted to ask is that I know it seemed to be outside the scope of what you talked about today, but to us who are living here, and I've been a long-term resident here, um, of what we call this world city of ours, it seems to be totally devoid of open space in terms of green grass, lawn areas. Now, I lived in Singapore for about 14 years, so I'm very, and I was, at the time, in the early 1990s, I was chairman of the Sports Development Board here, and I found that we had, at that time, it might be updated now, we had 43 green fields dedicated to sports, for between, shared between 7 million people. And at the same time, uh, in the early 90s, there are, I believe, in excess of 300 sports grounds shared among 4 million people in Singapore. And, you know, um, and here it seems that maybe my view is different. Every time we turn a private piece of ground into public use, like Cheda Gardens, we turn it into concrete. Now, to me, in every world city, You've got to have a park in the middle of a city, Central Park, Bois de Boulogne, Hyde Park, wherever you go, there is one, Hong Kong. It seems to be nowhere for office workers to run their dogs around, have a sandwich over lunch and so on and so forth. Uh, is there something which, in your opinion, as space architects, planners, um, a need for green fields in major cities that's accessible to not just the rich and the wealthy, but to everybody. Uh, I was actually very much um, a part of the Hong Kong Cricket Club. And the government took it back and say it's got to be dedicated for public use because we can't have a big ground right next to the China Bank building um, to, to the use of only 400 members playing a stupid game of cricket, British sport, you know. So we eventually lost and, and gave back to the government. What I see there is not very good use of a beautiful piece of lawn at, at, which looked right in the dead center of the city. Now it's all hidden, concreted. It seemed to be a gathering ground for protest. Um, i just like a comment on that, on the general usage without going to this urban stuff, which I'm, I'm very impressed with. Adam, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Um, well, thank you for your comment. I think we also agree that um, Hong Kong needs Kind of higher quality public space that uh, needs cleaner air, that it, it can use more trees. Although on the other hand, um, the, if you consider the kind of cumulative land of Hong Kong, it's in fact 70% uh, park, I believe. And so the city itself, I think, is for me what's e extremely exceptional about Hong Kong is this kind of uh, extreme juxtaposition of kind of uh, sort of city and nature. Um, and I think that uh, in a way, or maybe to kind of take, uh, for instance, the West Kowloon, the planning of the West Kowloon Cultural District, uh, Norman Foster's uh, winning scheme is the, the kind of primary arguments about the design are based on the uh, 10,000 trees 
uh, which are planned there. And now I think it's down to, to, to five or 6,000 trees. It's, the number has been kind of increasingly cut down. But in a way, I think the kind of outcome of our, of our studies, of our book, is that in fact kind of the three-dimensional connectivity of it will be a bigger factor in whether the space is uh, sort of successful or not uh, in the future. I, I, would, um, I would only add to that by saying, in reference to your first point, it's good to hear. I'm, I'm interested to know more about the origin of the express escalators. I've noticed some of them in, uh, I guess it's World Trade Center as well, um, uh, under the, the hotel. Um, <clears throat> but I think, I think Hong Kong has an obsession with connectivity. Uh, and our book was, um, and the, the express escalators are an expression of that obsession. Uh, uh, Chuntak Center or Queensway Plaza are great early examples of the obsession of that, of that connectivity. Our book is an illustration of the results of, of you know, 20 or 30 years of construction um, based on that obsession. Um, and our, our discovery, I would say, is that given the lack of public open space, these, um, these kind of connective uh, tissues in Hong Kong serve the city uh, as a substitute to public space um, and should be understood as a public space. In other words, uh, highways departments um, utter resistance to considering a footbridge to be a space where one could put a bench uh, and, and where people might sit, uh, I, I think is, is, uh, is something that we hope to change with our book. That we, can, we can illustrate that there is more, there's more potential uh, than they're actually enacting. That being said, I, um, Adam and I led a little walking tour yesterday that ended at the Tamar uh, site, Tamar, uh, the, the central government offices. There's plenty to say about what's good or bad about that building. Um, I also took a tour myself of the inside of the building, so uh, no comment at all on the workmanship. Um, but the, the podium design there, I think, is doing some things really, really well. The idea of bringing the lawn down to the waterfront of um, creating softer pedestrian connections with the waterfront, of mitigating to some degree the effects of that terrible road going along the water, uh, the intentions at least of the architect to network it back into the city, which are remarkably sort of foiled in this spectacular fashion by the MTR Corporation when, it, when that bridge hits, uh, stops, stops centimeters short of hitting Admiralty Center and then forces you to kind of circulate down as a round. You know, it. So, um, I, at least as a, a resident of Hong Kong for six years, have a kind of advanced uh, love-hate relationship with the city's connectivity and its, and its strange approaches to public space. Um, but I, I, um, I don't disagree with you that the city needs more green space and more open space, although I do suggest that what we do have is in itself valuable and interesting. Next question. The uh, pause a moment. The um, uh, city's bizarre crown seems to celebrate somewhat our elevated uh, connectivity, um, but I think that we can also see, uh, you know, we can see good things of it. Uh, people are willing to make detours and being forced to make elevation changes when it rains, uh, but otherwise we all like to be on the land that God has created which is our real ground. I mean, cities without ground suggest we have no ground, but I believe that the rain finds the ground and God has created the ground and all people know where the ground is. It's our most public space. And isn't that the, you know, the celebration of it, you, you could maybe just talk a little bit about the downsides, the, uh, the privatization of public space, um, the forced detours, the forced elevation changes, and the excuse of, uh, that it provides the highways department to completely annihilate ground level. Jonathan promised to deflect all the hard questions to me, so. <laughs> Specifically Paul's question. But I'll, I'll take it on, I'll, I'll, I can take it on if you like. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take it on very quickly, Paul, because of course we've had a, a longer discussion about, about these issues, but um, I've never heard anyone, uh, and I certainly wouldn't have expected you, Paul, to confuse the Hong Kong government with God um, you, you suggest the, that we want to be on the ground that God has created. Uh, in Central, of course, we're on the ground that the Hong Kong government has created uh, over many, many years of uh, uh, reclaiming land from the sea. Um, Hong Kong is in its entirety, mostly. I mean, I, I should be careful because there are not, the entire city is not Central, and the entire city is not even Sha Tin. 
but Hong Kong, by and large, is a construct. It's a, um, it's a, a kind of manufactured ground. Um, and I, I've, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, yes, I'm certainly prepared to, um, you know, to have a discussion about making that that constructed ground as pleasant as it can be and as functional as it can be. And I am as aghast as anybody at being penned up like a like cattle when I try to move around on the street uh, in Central. I think it's terrible. Uh, but I also think that the, the fruit is all worth celebrating. So uh, with that, I will deflect the comment to Adam about what it does. Yeah, I mean, I think one, one of the reasons why the book is called uh, Without Ground is indeed because um, we, we looked at the situation in Hong Kong and then we compared it to kind of other cities like uh, New York or Tokyo or Minneapolis where they have uh, both kind of uh, above ground and sort of underground, uh, very extensive kind of pedestrian networks. And what, what we found what, that was sort of unique in Hong Kong is that really there is no more reference to this kind of uh, stable, the sort of stable datum of the grounds. And in fact, you have kind of connections above, you have connections below, you have uh, cases where, for instance, a footbridge uh, sort of turns into a tunnel, and in a way, it's actually the kind of quality and the experience of the spaces is really ambiguous, um, or is really uh, not, let's say, um, not linked to whether they're happening on the ground plane. So in, I think in other, in many Western cities, for instance, New York, you could say that, um, you know, a ground, what happens on the ground plane is kind of clearly better than what is happening from, from a retail perspective from a kind of uh, public perspective from kind of experiential perspective than what's happening kind of several levels up in Hong Kong I think that's that's really not the case and we can we can create if we consider it if we consider them kind of all equal we can um, then start to imagine that um, they are all sort of have as a kind of um, a public dimension um, etc from the real estate um, operator's point of view, the reason why the connectivity is there is because of the back of the mind feeling that you will earn the most, you try to make every floor a ground floor. You, you know what I'm saying. Sure. So you've got this multi-story thing. I could tell you a story in Chunwan many, many years ago. The Wharf Group built a 14-story building that lifted containers to every level. So you've got this door to door idea. So, so basically, the gentleman over there. Uh, do you see the possibility that in the coming years a uh, substantial amount of Hong Kong's underground space will be developed for urban development like or even maybe the the, 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 the earth beneath the hill that makes the peak you know? um, uh, yes the whole rock cavern uh, conversation I mean I, I this is not my expertise. Can you put a you know a waste treatment facility in a rock cavern or a other large infrastructural thing? Um, to the extent that those things can be done, I expect they will be. Um, you you certainly easier politically easier to put uh, a, a lot of the city's larger, um, more offensive infrastructural programs uh, 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 deep in a hillside. Uh, it it's incredibly expensive to burrow into solid rock. Um, and most of the land works that get done on, on hillsides, for instance, are done by cut and fill, which is comparatively easy. You kind of scrape some land off and you push it to the side and you, you create a little flat space. And that's kind of terracing. That's, that's how the entire you know, Victoria Peak is, is occupied. Uh, so I, 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 I know as an amateur that uh, at the infrastructural scale that that's being studied. I, I see it as a slightly different phenomenon than, than this. Am I going to call it? Um, thanks for your presentation. Did, did you give any thought to the sort of informal rules of the road that develop on these human highways? I mean, you know, people tend to keep right, um, but people also walk five abreast really slowly in a way that would never be allowed on a real highway. And that, that was one question. The other one was um, air conditioning and humidity. Um, yeah, obviously, a lot of these walkways aren't air conditioned, but I feel like if you stay at that level, you spend more of your time in an air conditioned environment than otherwise. And I wondered if that was important. 
I'm going to jump to air conditioning slides while Adam answers. Yeah, actually, the uh, what you sort of brought up about uh, atmosphere, I think, is a, a really interesting point and a, a kind of um, dimension to our book as well, because we sort of saw that um, if you have a figure such as this, it uh, in fact kind of lacks the sort of legibility and kind of hierarchy that you have in a traditional city. So there's no, there's really no center, there's no edge, there's no nodes. Um, and what what happens instead is that um, this is central, by the way. Um, the, the spaces are kind of ordered, let's say, instead by indeed kind of temperature, uh, humidity, um, the, the kind of the use or the program that happens there often relates to what to, to whether they're kind of heavily air conditioned or sheltered or um, uh, kind of adjacent. Uh, uh, adjacent uh, emissions of sound and noise and this kind of thing and it I think the, for instance the one the one fascinating case really is um, sort of uh, the HSBC lobby which is of course taken very heavily used and taken over we speculated among other things because of the uh, sort of downdraft of air conditioning kind of coming out of that atrium that creates a very pleasant uh, sort of semi-conditioned uh, indoor outdoor space and that, that may be why um, in fact, uh, all these people are, are here um, in this space. Um, we have time for two more questions. So that gentleman first, and then... Uh, Alex McMillan. I, I guess I have quite a simple question, which is, do you think that this kind of connectivity or the way that Hong Kong has ended up being designed is good? Is it, is it is it a good thing? And then secondly, do you think that other cities will sort of follow suit later and we're just ahead, or is Hong Kong just unusual? That's a question also that we seem to get uh, actually every time that we, we present the book actually, and I think that um, our goal is actually not to uh, although, our, in a way, our maps are not that objective, we do claim to be kind of object, objective sort of mappers of these networks, and I think we're less we're less interested in um, as a whole whether it's kind of good or bad, uh, as what are the kind of what are the good components of it and what are the kind of bad components of it. And our 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 exercise or our project, I think, shows demonstrates where um, the kind of connections or the, the spaces are extremely efficient and uh, kind of interesting or perhaps very inefficient and therefore also kind of uh, to accommodate sort of uh, more, more activity or more. Well, I, I think it's not in a way, um, it's uh, if you step back to the assumption that in Hong Kong uh, we live in a certain amount of density uh, where that enables kind of 90% uh, of people to take public transportation to work, the cities without ground is simply a kind of outcome of that, and it's in fact the only way to make that work. So we could have a kind of city that, that looks like uh, many others in the world, and it could perhaps have more uh, parks and trees and wide boulevards, but everyone would also um, have to therefore drive to work, perhaps. The, the reason um, the good question is hard, I think for us particularly, is that it, 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 it suggests a kind of moral reading you know, to, to the city. And um, if good is, um, uh, a, a city with ground and whatever that means, a city with tree-lined streets where the cars move slowly and the pedestrians are um, quiet and uh, the air is clean, um, then there, perhaps there are things to critique Hong Kong about. If good is a city that is convenient and occupied and lively and well used and um, uh, many other things, then perhaps there are things to learn from Hong Kong. Uh, so I, I, I I'm willing to, and, and I think we, we all, all three of us are willing to say that we think the system overall is good, that there are good, th good things that relate to it. Um, I, certainly there are bad footbridges within that network, but they're ones that I would want to, want to change. There, there, there are areas that are either designed or have grown accidentally into better or worse conditions. Um, but I, I, I try to avoid bringing, a, for instance, a kind of a Western notion of what a good city is and kind of laminating that on top of a city that's grown under such unique circumstances, such as Hong Kong, uh, that, that it may have its own system of value to the judgment of what is good. I, I, prefer, I, I, prefer, I would prefer to be quiet, quiet.
quieter, so you won't go. But I, I, its liveliness is its own quality. It's not bad. It and, and, and I think maybe one, um, not to moralize more, but the, to answer the second part of your question also, I think it will, it is being seen as a kind of template for other cities. And the kind of three conditions that we identify that create this, which are uh, topography, climate, and density, I think if we see in, in other cities in the world perhaps undergoing densification or climate change, if we see sort of two out of three of these factors, we can uh, perhaps kind of similar systems will emerge uh, sort of elsewhere. I don't think that it can be in, in mainland China now, I think Hong Kong is seen really as a kind of model uh, to be kind of exported uh, to, to, to for cities literally to kind of copy Hong Kong, but obviously that can't happen. It has to be it's so specific to here um, that, again, it's kind of hard to... I think why we can say it's good is because it is being actually considered uh, sort of elsewhere. Okay, Bodine, would you like to ask the last question? It's historical. Um, you've talked about some of the early footbridges and so on, and how there were both top-down and bottom-up approaches and how it's created its own um, beautiful chaos. Mm. Uh, but which was the first, and why? Was it a private initiative? Was it a government initiative? Exactly, historically, <coughs> where would you place it? Um, I'd be careful, because there may be an actual historian in the room who can correct me. <laughs> I'm researching but, Hong Kong man. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. Well, it's my understanding that the, the Chatter Road footbridge was the first private in interior bridge linking two private properties over a public street. There is an earlier footbridge, literally an extra two stairs that lead up to an open deck that crosses a street in Causeway Bay um, from 61, I think. Um, but I, I, and I can look up the reference where I found that for you, but I, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm willing to be corrected. I think that's the first pedestrian walkway. But that was a highways department bridge it didn't link to properties, it simply got you across the street. Okay. You're welcome. Great, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, there's, um, um, uh, there are quite a few uh, copies of Cities Without Ground for sale um, just out there, um, which they will both be very happy to sign for you. Um, so please join me in um, thanking our two wonderful speakers today and um, hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.